Well, thank you all for coming this afternoon to our, our discussion panel presentation and discussion this afternoon about beef sustainability and ranching in Arizona. Um, I'm Lauren Mailing. I'm the executive director for the Arizona Beef Council. And what that is is we work for the beef, on behalf of the Beef Checkoff Program, which is um, our ranchers program in, across the country to do education and promotion um, on behalf of beef and ranching. And so that's what I get to do here in Arizona. We uh, today have Dr. Sarah Place, who will kick us off. How our format will work today is that we'll do the three presentations from Sarah and then from our two ranchers, Chuck Backus and Dean Fish. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion uh, at the end where we invite everyone to ask their questions and we'll have a great discussion about beef sustainability and ranching perspective here in Arizona. So to start with Dr. Place, um, Sarah is the Senior Director of Sustainable Beef Production and Research at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Her role is to oversee the Beef Checkoff funded sustainability program, including using the life cycle assessment to benchmark the U.S. beef industry's sustainability. Prior to joining NCBA, she was an Assistant Professor of Sustainable Beef Cattle Systems at Oklahoma State University for four years with a split research and teaching appointment. At OSU, um, her research program focused on the measurement of enteric methane emissions from cattle. And her teaching responsibilities included animal nutrition, dairy, dairy cattle science, ethics and professionalism, and sustainable animal agriculture. Prior to that, she served on the National Ac Academies of Science Committee on considerations for the future of animal science research that published the report critical role of animal science research in food security and sustainability. Sarah received her PhD in animal biology from the University of California at Davis, her bachelor's in animal science from Cornell University, and her associates of applied science and ag business from Morrisville State College. Sarah, thank you for coming. Well, thanks for the introduction and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, just to start, um, not familiar with what, what all your background is with uh, beef production in the United States, so I thought I'd start with just kind of an overview of how cattle production actually works within the United States. Um, so this is a, a gross simplification, but it kind of gives you an idea of the different segments that exist within the U.S. cattle industry. Um, so in the United States, we kind of think about all cattle mostly starting on what we call cow-calf operations. Um, so what you're going to hear from a little bit later, we're going to talk about uh, cow-calf producers and cow-calf production here in the state of Arizona. But essentially, cow-calf production is kind of what it sounds like. There's the mother cows, and then they have a calf ideally once per year, right? Those are mainly grass-based operations. The management of those systems varies greatly across the entire United States from arid environments like here in Arizona uh, to more humid environments back in the East Coast. And essentially, cattle will be on those operations. It depends, uh, but roughly about six months, six, seven months, they're going to be weaned. The calves will be weaned from their mother. And from that point on, they can either stay on that operation or they may move on to the next phase of the cattle production cycle. And that's the stalker or backgrounder uh, phase. So stalker and backgrounder, these animals are going to be consuming, again, mostly forage. Um, backgrounders are typically what we think about cattle going into a confinement feeding situation, a feedlot situation, uh, versus stalker cattle are going to be mostly grazing uh, cattle, and that varies greatly across the United States. So we have unique systems, like in the southern Great Plains, where cattle will graze on winter wheat pasture, especially this time of year. Uh, to places like in California, right, where they may be moving up in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so it all depends on where the animals actually are and really it depends on the forage or the grass availability. So from there, uh, the cattle will move on to the finishing phase. Um, and so this is really where when you hear about grass versus grain finishing, there's really actually a divergence in the production systems, right? So most cattle in the United States are finished on a grain-based diet um, in feed yards. So they'll be consuming on average, now it's about a 55% corn grain usually diet, but that also depends on where you are in the United States. You may be feeding more wheat if you have that available. Um, and so that phase of the animal's life lasts around four to six months. So essentially cattle are spending about two thirds of their life on grass, and then that last third, 
they're either going to be grass finish or they will be consuming more forage, more grass, or they'll go to get a uh, grain finished diet and actually be finished that way. So just a little bit of background on that just to start off because this terminology, we'll, we'll kind of use it throughout the whole uh, session and just so you're a little bit familiar. So when we think about sustainability, it's a really complex topic, right? And I'm probably not telling uh, you guys anything you don't know, but when we think about sustainability, it's really about those three different pillars, right? Environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social sustainability. And when we think about our food system and how cattle production fits within that, it's quite complex, right? We have to think about, uh, of course, environmental impacts, environmental footprints, and as I go through the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna be talking a lot about that. Um, but we're going to be missing a lot of the other aspects of sustainability as well if we don't consider them, right? So everything from rural livelihoods and the economic viability of our producers, but also the affordability of food, right, is relevant to sustainability, um, to things like nutritional quality, the welfare of animals, um, the actual individual agency of people and culture and traditions, right? All those things fall under sustainability. So it is a wildly complex topic, and all those things are interrelated as well. So just to set that up, even though I'm going to be mostly focusing on the environmental side, just to, just to tip our hat to the fact that it is a complex topic. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, upcycling, right? So I think a lot of people are familiar with that word when we think about upcycling furniture now, right? People have a, maybe a Pinterest page where they're looking at <laughs> new ideas of how they can recycle or upcycle furniture. But it also relates to our food system and really relates to ruminant animals like cattle and what they're doing within our food system. So upcycling in terms of a definition of it, right, we've, we've all heard of recycling, taking something and making something of essentially equivalent value. Upcycling is taking something of little to no value and making a higher value product, right, hence the up part of that, part of that word. So when we think about what cattle do within the food system, that's really what they are doing. They're taking feeds and grasslands, um, landscapes that can't be used for anything else from a food production standpoint and making a higher value product. Um, so of course we can think about that flow of solar energy through the system in terms of that energy being locked up mostly in cellulose of plants, human and edible material, right? Um, and cattle being able to uniquely break that down because of their symbiotic relationship that they have with all the microbes that live within their, in their gut, right? And able to make a high quality product, not just high quality from a desirability standpoint, but the protein itself within uh, animal source foods is of course, has the essential amino acids and is, tends to be more bioavailable than plant-based sources of protein. So um, the numbers that are up on the screen, this is from a CAST report uh, that came out um, in 1999, looking at essentially taking into account what cattle eat that is actually human edible. This is kind of a weird concept, but the idea of how much human edible protein do they consume and how much do they return in the form of beef, okay? So human edible protein sources that cattle eat, I mentioned that grain finishing part of the cattle's life cycle, that's really when they're gonna be consuming foods that could technically be eaten by people even if we don't wanna eat those, those foods directly, but we could if we had to, right? Um, and so for every one pound of human edible protein that cattle consume, they're returning more. They're returning about 1.19 pounds, that's what that report found um, as a US average. So that may seem a little counterintuitive. How can you make something more than, than is being consumed, right? So hopefully this makes sense down in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the screen. What this donut chart is showing you, it's kind of hearkening back to that life cycle I referenced, is most of what cattle are eating in their lifetime to generate beef is grass and forage material, right? So about 80% of it is grass in the United States or hay. Another 10% are what we could call essentially plant leftovers. So all the byproduct feeds that we, the, the industry term that we use, byproducts, things like dried distiller's grains, right, from corn ethanol production for fuel, or cotton seed, right, from cotton production for fiber production. And there's lots of examples of essentially food byproducts, food processing byproducts being fed back to cattle. So up in Colorado, there's a lot of sugar beets that are grown. Um, and the beet pulp from those systems will often get fed back to cattle, right? So there's all these, again, these integrations between feed, animal feed, and human food in that case, and that makes up a significant portion of animals' diets too. 
So only about 10, 9, 10% of what cattle grain finished cattle eat in their lifetimes is actually grain. That sometimes surprises people, but again, that's taking into account the full life cycle. So that's how we get to this situation of being able to generate more protein than the animals are eating from a human edible standpoint, because most of what they're eating is not human edible. Right? So this is one of those great examples of the trade-offs in sustainability, right? So we're talking about cattle, but other ruminant animals like sheep and goats also have this ability to do this upcycling process. But they also, all three of those species, produce methane gas naturally, right, from their, from their ruminants. So if you're not familiar with what a ruminant animal is, um, the reason we call them ruminants is their stomach, instead of just having a single gastric comp compartment like ours, right, they actually have four compartments in their stomach. The biggest one is the rumen, um, and that is filled with literally trillions of microorganisms, right? So when cattle are eating, they're actually feeding those microbes that are then breaking down the material that they consume. Um, and they're using the byproducts of that fermentation process for their own life processes. So it's a really unique system. But if you're familiar with fermentation, whether you've done any home brewing or baking bread, right, you know there's a lot of gas that gets produced too. So there is a lot of CO2 that gets produced, but also methane gas. Um, and so cattle have to remove that gas about once per minute through a process called eructation. Um, and it is always important to note, and that's always say, uh, or what I always try to mention, is like if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, just know it comes out the front end of the animal, right, not the back end, right? So it's cow burps, not cow farts. Um, and so that, that is, again, a natural process in terms of cattle producing methane. Another thing that sometimes surprises people is when cattle are eating more fibrous material, more grass, more hay, they actually make more methane. Right? When they're consuming a grain-based diet, they're making less methane. So the more digestible that feed is, the more starch that's available in their diet, the less methane that they actually make. So the other thing about beef production is just the unique aspects of the land that actually supports beef production in the United States and really throughout the whole world. Right? So cattle essentially expand the land base that we have available for food production, and well-managed grazing systems can enhance oftentimes those ecosystems or work in, in symbiosis with those natural ecosystems. So I always like this map. This is a map from the American Farmland Trust. They're a group that's interested in the loss of especially prime farmland to development across the United States. And so really that's what those uh, red colors are all around the cities of the United States. That's where we've lost a lot of farmland due to development, subdivisions, um, you know, strip malls, things like that. But this also shows all the land use types from the USDA kind of spread out on a color map as well, right? So there are kind of brownish colors over in the eastern US. That's where we have most of our forest lands, right? That's what that color is. The dark green, like the Corn Belt, Mississippi River Valley, um, Central Valley of California, up in eastern Washington, that's our cropland, okay, the dark green. The lighter green and the lighter yellow-ish colors, so all of our federal public lands, um, and then private lands in the western U.S., that's our range lands, grazing lands, essentially, of the United States. So what's important is that that is about 40% of the land area of the lower 48, right? Both pasture, which would be more managed, and rangeland, which is not as managed or has no management in terms of inputs. Um, and so that land really can't be cultivated for growing crops that we would consume directly as people, right? It's too arid, too rocky, too steep. We have lost a lot of grassland that maybe shouldn't have been plowed, right, in the central United States, um, but that is one of those key aspects from a land use perspective is the suitability. What is it actually suitable for? The black box over Iowa, it's not a discrimination against Iowa or anything, right? So I always have that up there. I forget to put the animation on. But essentially, uh, that is roughly the area, okay, of corn grain that goes to cattle, right? So it's not necessarily like that's the geographic location, but just give you an idea of the size. So that's about 7.5 million cropland acres. It's about 2% of the cropland acres in the United States. Um, that go to cattle. And again, that's because we're feeding around two, two and a half to 2.6 pounds of corn grain per pound of beef in the U.S. that gets produced. Um, so just to give you a frame of reference, essentially that's the land that beef is using or any other cropland that beef is using that could be used for something else and the rest of it is that land that's unsuitable. So the last thing I'll quickly talk to you about is just how the U.S. compares to the rest of the world, right? We talk about carbon footprints or other environmental footprints. They're very 
variable geographically. Um, and I'll use carbon as an example here. Um, and the United States has made changes over time that have shrunk our environmental footprint. I'll mention that as well. So when we think about carbon footprints, uh, this is information from a, a paper that came out a few years ago now in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences looking at carbon intensities or carbon footprints uh, for all different livestock species or animal products, including beef, okay, around the world. So the scale, if you can't see it at the bottom, is essentially kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of, of protein for beef in this case. So the, the darker green colors on this map, like in North America, in Western Europe, that's where we have to have, tend to have lower carbon footprints, okay? The lighter green color, that's our intermediate carbon footprints, and the purple is where we have some of the highest carbon footprints um, for beef in the world. So Sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent. So those areas can have carbon footprints that are 50 to 100 times higher than in the United States, okay? So you may be wondering what is going on there. That's a lot of variation in terms of, of footprints. A lot of it can be explained essentially by the number of live animals it takes to produce the product, in this case, beef, okay? And so by live animals, they don't just mean the cattle that actually go to slaughter, but also all the supporting animals, right? The cows, the bulls, what we call replacement heifers, the animals that we need to support um, the actual herd. So for example, in the United States, we're the number one beef producer in the world. We produced last year around 26 billion pounds of beef. And we had a cattle herd size, all beef and dairy cattle together, of about 94 million head. Okay. If we were to go to Brazil, which is the number two beef producer in the world, they produced around 21 billion pounds of beef last year, but they had a cattle herd of 220 million head. Okay. So they have twice as many cattle as us, but they make less beef. Right? And as I just told you, in terms of the belching out of the methane every single day, right, and all those resources that are required, hopefully that makes sense about why, again, the footprint differences exist on the map. So this is not to put down any region of the world or anything like that. Um, obviously, there are cultural differences, people that are raising animals more from a standpoint of equity, right, and having wealth rather than trying to just produce the end product, right? So that explains a lot of that variation that exists on the screen. And I've mentioned greenhouse gas emissions a few times, um, but just to give you a bit of a context in terms of what the EPA inventory would show us, the inventory that gets put out for greenhouse gas emissions every April is direct emissions that come from cattle. So this would be just the methane that animals are belching up and any emissions that come from their manure is around 2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's roughly equivalent to landfills, and I always bring this up usually when there's food in an event, right, just to, to make you feel guilty is, of course, one of the number one sources of waste that goes into landfills that generates methane gas is food waste, right? So from a food system sustainability, that's really a key issue. In the United States, uh, transportation, electricity are about 26, 30 percent of our emissions. Of course, we burn a lot of fossil fuels in the United States for all of our energy purposes, and that really dwarfs uh, emissions from agriculture, which in total is about 9% uh, of U.S. emissions altogether, all plant and animal agriculture. So that said, um, one of the key things that we do at NCBA from a sustainability standpoint is benchmarking where we're at, right? It's kind of the old adage of you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? Um, and so as a part of that process, one of the things that we've done over the last several years is looked at the entire United States knowing that we have a tremendous amount of geographic variability and surveyed producers around the U.S. to understand what are their environmental footprints across the United States, what are the things they could control and the things they can't control, um, and again, give us a benchmark to know where we can go from in the future. So what you're looking at here is a map of essentially how we broke the U.S. up into seven regions. Uh, we had to draw the line somewhere, right, but we tried to make it um, where both the cattle management and obviously the climate is somewhat similar across those different regions. Over the course of those four years, like I mentioned, we essentially did both online surveys and in-person visits across all these regions to get about 2,300 different producers information um, from everything of what kind of breeds of cattle they, they have to um, what they're feeding their animals, all the basic management information. So we use that information to conduct a partial life cycle assessment of U.S. beef, and actually that work is still ongoing. 
Um, but essentially the results that I'm gonna show you is what we call a cradle to farm gate life cycle assessment for beef. So cradle meaning all the upstream inputs in terms of fertilizer, any electricity use, et cetera, all the way to the point where the animals leave the farm gate, right, and actually go on to, to a packing plant. So this is just sort of a visual representation of essentially what we did. Um, we used a model called the Integrated Farm Systems Model that is uh, publicly available from, from USDA Ag Research Service to essentially simulate representative operations within each one of these regions and help us generate uh, inventories of both things like carbon, reactive nitrogen, understand where our blue water use is coming from, energy use, et cetera. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we did use or did look at uh, the upstream effects too, right? B big ones being uh, fertilizer or any electricity use that's used on the operation, understanding how much carbon emissions are coming from that process as well. So the next four slides, I'm just gonna show you essentially the regional variability uh, that exists in that range at the top across those seven regions in terms of regional averages. And then the pie chart is essentially showing you where, the, where these different emissions or energy use is coming from, okay? So for carbon emissions, uh, the range we found was 17 to 27 carbon dioxide equivalents. And probably most of you are familiar in the audience, but of course different greenhouse gases have different potentials to trap heat. And so we put them all on a similar basis, a 100 year global warming potential basis. Uh, per kilogram of carcass weight was our, was our functional unit in this case. So in terms of where those emissions are coming from, again, one, there is a fair amount of variability across the region. Some of that is just inherent characteristics of where the farms are located, right? So in the eastern U.S., we have more moisture um, and soils that need fertilizer. And so some of that is kind of, out of outside of their control in terms of nitrous oxide emissions that may come from soil. But regardless of where we're looking at across the United States, the animal itself and most of that blue chunk, that's 58%, is that enteric methane I mentioned earlier, okay, in terms of the natural production of methane gas uh, that occurs from the animals. Uh, emissions from manure, around 7%. Feed production would be all of our uh, soil emissions. Again, most of that's going to be nitrous oxide. The 4% is um, any equipment use or any combustion on on the farm in terms of fossil fuel use. And then 13%, that is as upstream emissions, right? So fertilizer, embedded uh, carbon that's associated with fertilizer or electricity use. If somebody's using electricity and it's linked back to the grid on a coal-fired power plant, uh, we took that into account as well. So reactive nitrogen also varied uh, across the region. So reactive nitrogen, if you're not familiar, essentially all forms of nitrogen that are not dinitrogen gas, right? As soon as nitrogen can get out into the, into the ecosystem, it can kind of cascade uh, through many different forms. And so we were interested in understanding where those emissions were coming from. Most of it, if you're familiar with this area, it's probably not surprising. It comes from ammonia, mostly from manure, but also any ammonia that comes from fertilization of soils, uh, nitrate leaching, and then any denitrification, nitrification. Again, that's more, seeing that more in the eastern United States uh, where we have wetter soils. So fossil energy use, um, there was less variability with fossil energy use across uh, the regions, and most of it was in those upstream portions, right? Both the electricity and then the embedded energy in fertilizer production. Um, and then about 21% was the actual production of feed. Any, um, anything else was fairly minor. And I forgot to mention, but essentially, we also looked at this and scaled it up to the whole U.S. So um, this is about 0.6 or 0.7 percent of total fossil energy use um, in the United States. The greenhouse gas emissions, I told you the 2 percent earlier for the EPA. If we take into account feed and all these other aspects, it's about 3.3 percent of emissions in the United States. So again, that gives us a benchmark of where, where we are. Blue water consumption, um, so if you're not familiar with water footprints, there's different types of water that are accounted for. So there's blue water, which is surface and groundwater, green water, which would be essentially precipitation water, evapotranspiration water, and then gray water would be any water that required to dilute out, um, dilute out, dilute out any pollutants in water. So we really focused in on blue water because that's kind of one, the major use. We can't really control precipitation that falls on rangelands, obviously. Um, and blue water use varied the greatest of all the impact categories we looked at across the United States. 
again, probably not too surprising, the eastern U.S., there's hardly any irrigation happening on the eastern side of the Mississippi. So most of that blue water use is anything that animals consume. Uh, and then when we get out into the western U.S., it's all very highly dependent on if people are irrigating or not um, and how much water is embedded in feed, essentially. So that's what's shown on the pie chart is essentially those two big chunks are either feed production on the operation or anything that's been purchased, right, that required uh, feed that was purchased that required irrigation. So drinking water is only about 3% of water, right? It's a very minor uh, contribution in the whole grand scheme of things. So with that said, that was a very brief overview of just kind of a highlight of some of the things that we work on at NCBA, again, and from, from a standpoint of benchmarking where we are at. Um, and we're doing more research in terms of understanding um, from a case study approach, what can our producers actually do, right? Financially, what can they actually change on their operations? Or again, how much of this is just baked into, again, their geographic location? So from a bottom line standpoint, how we think about sustainability for beef, it's not one production system over another or one you know, eating pattern over another from, from a standpoint of you as a consumer. It's just about getting everything better over time. Right? It's about continuous improvement of the system. So for beef, it's about producing safe, nutritious, high-quality beef while balancing economic viability, right? social responsibility, environmental stewardship, and finding some sort of sweet spot there. But it's not going to be the same for all of our producers, as you'll hear in a little bit. Right? Even within the state of Arizona, we have tremendous variation that exists, and what the correct uh, mix of practices is is going to change depending on where you're at. So with that said, um, if you're interested in any more information, the website that's on the screen has it. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Lauren to keep us going. Thank you, Sarah. And we will have time, plenty of time for questions at the end, so we can ask those to, our, to Sarah and the rest of the panel at that time. And as a reminder, because we don't want any food waste, there are lots of snacks in the back. There are some um, beef sliders, some beef and bean burritos, and some veggie empanadas and brownies. So please help yourself, and maybe this is a good time if you'd like, while I'm giving Chuck's introduction, um, if you'd like to grab one of those at this time. Now bear with me because I don't want to leave any of this out because Chuck's um, background is quite fascinating, especially in relation to us here at um, ASU. Chuck was raised on a dairy farm in Ohio and then decided to become an engineer. After Sputnik was launched in 1957, he became interested in power for space and ended up receiving his PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of Arizona. He worked in the space power industry for a few years before joining the faculty here at Arizona State University. And through research and leadership, he became one of the international founding fathers of solar electric power for terrestrial use. Then in 1977, Chuck's roots in agriculture drew him back, and Chuck and his wife Judy bought the Quarter Circle, Ran Quarter Circle U Ranch in the Superstition Mount Mountains, which is due east of here, um, past Apache Junction and Gold Canyon. This is one of the oldest ranches in Arizona, and the ranch house was built in 1876. And some of these, these photos that will be rolling while Chuck speaks are photos of the ranch, and you can, so you can see what the terrain looks like. If you've ever hiked in the Superstition Mountains in the Peralta Trail, you know this is a very rough country, and the ranch consists of pastures of canyons, rocks, and cactus. And is an all-horseback ranch, meaning there aren't roads that you can jump on an ATV or a quad or a truck to go from pasture to pasture. Chuck retired from his day job at ASU in 2004, and after extensive research, because after all he is a researcher, the ranch goal became to raise cattle that would raise calves with high quality carcasses for that beef quality and to further retain ownership of those calves through finishing and onto the packing plant to obtain premiums for the high quality beef that he raises. He started using AI, which for some is not artificial intelligence, but for us in ranching is artificial insemination, to utilize the best Ang Angus uh, genetics available. He receives detailed carcass data for each calf, then any cow that raises a calf with inferior quality then gets sold. Chuck's detailed record keeping, individual animal identification, and research enable all calves to be certified for marketing programs 
like age and source verification, natural beef programs, and non-hormone treated programs, thus receiving economic financial premiums when he sells his cattle. All bulls are selected by their genetic markers through a vast measurement called EPDs, the expected progeny difference in those animals. His progressive ways of ranching have resulted in receiving several awards from the Arizona Cattle Growers Association, the Arizona Beef Council, the National Certified Angus Beef Program, and last December, the Arizona Pioneering Stockman of the Year Award at the Arizona National Livestock Show. He's currently president of the Arizona Cattle Industry Research and Education Foundation. Help me in welcoming Chuck to the stage. Well, she talks so much about me, I'm not sure I have much to say now. Um, but I am, uh, we've been ranchers in Arizona for 42 years. We're on our 42nd year uh, with this ranch and superstitions. Um, I'm not a typical rancher in that I, as you just heard, I'm an engineer. <clears throat> I came to to ASU as an engineering professor, I realized this morning, over 50 years ago, um, in the fall of 68. So um, it has changed a lot since then. Uh, engineering started at, after 58, so been involved a long time. But that makes me unique as a rancher because I'm a numbers guy. And most ranchers are not number people. They're in it for all kinds of reasons, mostly hereditary. And um, I got in it because I was just interested in it. But uh, the Superstition Ranch is, uh, you've probably been very close or on our ranch because if you've gone to Parole to Trailhead, at uh, in the Superstition Wilderness area, you go across our ranch to get there. You go into Peralta Trailhead, you go off our ranch and into the wilderness area. We run <clears throat> along the southern edge of the wilderness area on state trust land. Uh, we have about 10 miles of common border with the wilderness. It is a very rough area. You can drive to the ranch house, but then everything else is horseback. The ranch house is still, the headquarters I should say, is still seven miles from the nearest electrical, electrical line. And um, being as I was in solar and photovoltaics in particular, uh, from the time I came to ASU in um, 68 before I bought the ranch. And so it's very conscious uh, for me to uh, look for the moment to uh, convert the ranch to being solar powered. And when the wind blew my windmill apart two years after I bought it, I decided that was the time. So our ranch has been entirely solar powered for over 39 years. It's uh, changed a lot over that time from running water uh, pumps to uh, providing lighting for the, the, the caretaker cowboy who lived there at the time. Um, over the years and gotten more sophisticated such that now our ranch manager lives in a, uh, in a photovoltaic covered house. Uh, the house is air conditioned and heated with photovoltaics. So it's just gotten more sophisticated over the time. One of the things I wanted to, to point out is solar is usually considered um, an environmental friendly um, characteristic, which it is, but uh, solar pumping of water is an extremely important phenomenon in Arizona. Um, I, I, converted 39 years ago to solar pumping, and I probably have seven or eight solar pumps. Uh, I have two ranches, uh, 
At least I did until last week. My wife tells me I'm supposed to slow down. Um, the, the good thing about solar pumping of water is not the non-use of gasoline or the use of wind, uh, but it's in the saving of water. The nice thing about photovoltaics as an energy source is you have electricity for other uses. And for water pumping, that means that you can put a switch on your, uh, a float switch, a simple float switch on your tank that you're pumping, so it turns the water off when your tank is full. If you look at a normal windmill, it sits there and any time a wind's blowing, it's pumping water. And most of the time, it's pumping water out on the ground. Because if the wind's blowing day or night, it's pumping water. And the nice thing about a solar pump, it pumps the water you need for the storage tank and cuts itself off. And uh, that is um, true for all kinds of applications in, in uh, solar. You have an electrical source so you can control the situation. Uh, I was supposed to talk about uh, what we do in, in ranching, and again, I'm not a, a typical rancher, although I'm getting to be more typical as uh, the other ranchers are catching on to data collection and decision making. Um, but I uh, decided to um, raising cows in the country that we have and the superstitions, and if you've hiked out there, you know it's a tough place to raise a cow. And I've often had times having trouble describing the kind of country I raise cows in. And I usually got down to it's just canyons, rocks, cactus, and bushes. After some rains, there's some grass, but you don't rely on that. Um, but I was talking to the communications expert for the cattle growers in Arizona the other day, and I said, I, I can't describe my country very well. I run in, you're a communicator, what, how would you describe it? She's ridden on the ranch. And she said, well, you raise cattle in, in um, Rocky Mountain, Bighorn sheep country. And that's probably uh, a good description. And I, we do have a lot of bighorn sheep on our, on our ranch, and it's the kind of country. But it's the kind of country you can't use for anything else. As Sarah mentioned, most of the ranches use unhuman edible materials. And one of the reasons I uh, went into ranching was to improve the environment. And grazing, if properly done, can do that. And so um, that was one of my early um, uh, intentions, and I did a lot of range management kinds of things. We set up transects to monitor the condition of the grass in several parts of the ranch, and we've been monitoring that every year for almost 40 years. 39 years or so. And we'll go out again in January and, and read those transacts again so you know what the land is doing and whether your techniques are, are, uh, are um, successful or not. In Arizona, rain is what determines the success of your program. When it rains, things grow and cows do fine. And when there's drought like the last two years, it's very difficult to, uh, to stay alive. Um, well, in these, uh, this kind of country, and again, I'm more rugged than most of the Arizona rangelands, um, I decided that what I needed to do is to produce a more expensive product to sell. And after an analysis, um, I decided where I need to focus on is developing high quality carcass calves because the feedlots that do most of the finishing of the cattle in this country sell to packing plants. And the packing plant started about 15 years ago of paying more for cattle coming in that 
they could sell for more, meaning a higher quality cut of meat. And so I decided to start raising high quality cattle. And for the most part, that means the marbling in the, your steak is what provides all of the good tastes. Um, marbling is just uh, fine fat tissue in, in the um, meat material that you have a good tasty, juicy steak that comes from the marbling in the steak. And that is traditionally not raised in rough country. And uh, so I had to get into the genetics. One of my biggest problems over all these years is, well, my, my cows are raised on the ranch, so they, they're acclimated to it. And I can't bring in outside cattle. If I bring in replacement heifers or cows, they don't know what to eat. They don't know you're supposed to eat trees and bushes and so forth. So they starve to death, literally starve to death. And so I have to raise my own calves, but I've always had trouble with bulls. You have to bring in fresh genetics on a regular basis so you don't get inbred. And so how do you keep bulls alive? And so, and I've lost a lot of bulls. Anyway, I um, develop management techniques so that they're only with the cows in the least demanding pasture in the rotation system. Uh, and that helps, but what I really, uh, when I got in studying genetics of producing better beef, is in the use of artificial insemination. And now that is pretty prevalent in, in the United States. And I essentially artificially inseminate every female I have. So, and that's been usually about 400 cows, including replacement efforts. So we, AI every one of them that we can find at the time. So we probably average 95% of them are bred. And then we turn them out with the bulls for this limited time in a, in a uh, environmental friendly to bulls pasture. Um, that allows me to buy the best semen of any bull in the country. And I have catalogs after catalogs of bulls, and they're getting more and more definition of the genetic characteristics of those bulls. And there's what's called expected progeny differences that are projected from the, uh, the analysis of DNA in, in bulls and, and their actual production of calves and what are the characteristics of their offspring that you can now relate back and choose bulls to develop what you want. So I, I have two major factors that I select for. The other thing I, I should mention before I get into that is that I think that the future of the beef industry is based on one of those parameters. And the most important parameter, I think, for future beef production is feed conversion efficiency. That means how many pounds of feed does it take to put on a pound in a cow? Well, as, as Sarah briefly discussed, cow's digestive systems are unique of most, most game uh, or most animals in the world in that they have these four stomachs, which means they can convert almost any cellulosic material that exists, they can digest it and turn that into, into meat and uh, bone. And that means that they can eat just about anything. It, uh, they may have to adjust their taste to enjoy it, but they're capable of digesting anything but was not determined recently, until recently, about how much feed it can take to produce a beef, of, a pound of beef, a cow. If, if you've had agriculture courses in high school or in college, you've learned that, well, chickens are the best convert, well, I guess fish are, but chickens convert about two to one 
two pounds of grain, you get one pound added to the chicken. Pigs are maybe three and a half to one, and cows are maybe six or seven to one. Uh, and those numbers have gone down over the years. I think chickens are down to about 1.5 to one, and uh, pigs have made progress. They couldn't measure individual cow conversion efficiencies until about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Some Canadian engineers came up with a way that you can monitor the individual intake of a cow in a social environment, meaning in a pen of cows. If you isolate them, they just don't eat right. So they have to do it in the crowd. And so by the use of electronic ear tags, which I use on all my cows, this is an electronic ear tag. Uh, I put them on all my cows, all my calves, and so, and I register them with the National Register so that those cows, I do it for traceability, and so I put those on calves, and I, it also helps in processing because you swipe a wand by their head and electronically it gives, in our case, the weight of the cow and, and who it is and what their ranch tag is and all that information. But electronically, if, if you have a cow on feed, then you can individually measure if you have a feeder that's on a, a scale when a bull says, puts his head in and says, ABC 2541, just stuck his head in, here's what the scale weighs, and when he takes it out, it says, that bull's gone, here's what the scale weighs. And if you do that for a couple months, you can get how many pounds did that animal consume, and then you can easily measure how much they gain. That wasn't known for cows until about 15 years ago. But the surprising thing in that ability to measure is that cows vary in their conversion ratios. Some cows will convert feed to meat at 12 to 1, 12 pounds of feed required to put on one pound. Other cows can convert at 4 to 1, a factor of 3 less, a factor of 3. And I've, uh, and here in Arizona where I buy most of my bulls, where they measure that, and so you can buy bulls for, for your herd barrels that have those actually measured on the individual bulls. And so I choose those bulls. I require them to be measured for that. And then I buy the ones that are very efficient. The, um, I have used AI bulls that have a conversion ratio of 2.64. Two and a half pounds roughly to put on a pound. So if we get our industry to focus on that and go down that way, I raise these quality cows by genetics. I then background them out on the ranch and I send them to a feedlot in Oklahoma. I retain ownership. They're fed in Oklahoma. They're slaughtered usually in Kansas, harvested, sorry, uh, in Kansas uh, usually, and but they, I sell to whoever the highest bidder is, but I get individual carcass data back. So I know for every animal I raise and send to the feedlot and they become meat for your freezer, I know how much that calf weighed when it went into the packing plant, what its carcass weight was after it was slaughtered, what the grade was that you cut between the 12th and 13th rib and you grade them, and I know how big the ribeye was. I know how much fat is on the outside of that animal. All that data comes back to me on each individual calf I have. So I can use that as a selection criteria. I know who its father was. I know who its mother was. And I probably know their mothers as well. So uh, I, I can trace that and measure it and improve it. And that's where the engineering uh, background helps. Um, Maybe I better quit since Lauren's standing up. So there'll be time for questions and answers, I think.
later. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Next, we have Dean Fish, who is the ranch manager for the Santa Fe Ranch in Nogales, Arizona. So now we're going to the southern border of our state. Sorry. And the owner of Anchor F Cattle Company. As the ranch manager for the Santa Fe Ranch Foundation, Dean works to develop problem-solving research for his fellow beef producers. The foundation also works to get kids outdoors through agricultural literacy, hiking, camping, and learning about the environment. Dean also raises commercial Angus cattle and calves for youth to show at livestock fairs and shows. His cattle genetics utilize the top Angus sires available to him through artificial insemination, AI again, um, and procuring the top Angus sires. Prior to managing the ranch, Dean was an extension livestock specialist for the University of Arizona. Dean currently serves on the Arizona Beef Council Board and is also a board member of the Arizona Cattle Growers Association. And he's been involved in, in the livestock industry his whole life, he says, so far. <laughs> um, but it's been, been part of who he is for, for, since his beginning, starting with his first 4-H calf, calf, Fatso, when he participated in 4-H programs and continues to volunteer today. Dean is Beef Quality Assurance Certified, which many of our ranchers in Arizona utilize, the BQA program, and practices low stress handling and stockmanship. He also teaches seminars across the country on stewardship and stockmanship, and look, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about what that is, Dean. Dean, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I, I appreciate that introduction. After that introduction, I'm excited to hear what I have to say. <laughs> um, and I, and I, um, I, I, I do have to admit that I'm a U of A graduate, and so um, after Saturday, um, um, I have to concede that <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a fun game to watch, but not a good result for me. But um, anyway, um, as, as Lauren said, I ranch right on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, east and north of Nogales, Arizona. Um, I've, I grew up in that part of the world. And um, when I really start thinking about sustainability, I've, I've had a long relationship with sustainability, whether I knew it or not. Um, and we, you know, and, and Sarah did a really, really nice job in that one slide that showed that the, those three different pieces of sustainability. And, and I always think of it myself as a three-legged stool. You've got to have all three of those legs solid underneath you um, for that stool to continue to serve its function. And so economic, environmental, and societal. And so every action and decision, major decision that I make on that ranch, I, I try to think of, you know, how is it impacting those legs of that stool? Which one am I strengthening? Am I weakening one? Um, and, and, and how can I do a better job of doing that? I think um, in my position, the, the, ran the ranch that I manage and I now lease um, is a ranch that my father managed for 35 years. And so one of the things my father told me when I, when I took over the management of this ranch was, don't screw it up. <laughs> um, you know, and so I, I think thinking about that in a, in a deeper way, I think when, you know, when we go into ranching, we have the responsibility to care for a piece of ground or, or a business or, or a piece of the environment. Um, it's a huge responsibility to think about it. And I think most often our goal is, is to make it better than when we got it. And so that's, that, those are kind of the factors that go into my day-to-day decision-making. Um, and I'm going to talk just briefly about a couple of the different pillars and a couple of those different legs of that stool that I think are very important. And Chuck... Um, mentioned rangeland monitoring and monitoring that he does in pasture rotation. Range monitoring is how we measure the productivity of our grasslands, of our rangelands. And so we do that um, in, in by monitoring it. We can't manage what we don't measure, I think was said before. And so on my main ranch, I have seven different pastures. And if I think about those pastures, and I'm actually pretending to do it there. Um, <laughs> um, but if I think about those, if I think about that, those forage species in that, in my environment, the most 
vulnerable time or the most critical time for growth of those forage species is during the summer. That's when I get the majority of my rain. I have mostly warm season, annual, perennial grasses, shrubs, and so forth. And so my, in my part of the world, the rains hopefully are started by the 4th of July and will go through September in most years. And so we'll go out and we'll, and this is the dumbest thing I do all year long, I promise you, but we go out and we count grass. So in each of those seven pastures, I have what we call a key area. And that key area represents an area that is that would represent typical grazing in a pasture. So not real close to water where a lot of cows congregate, uh, but not real far away so that we get what typical grazing over a, over a larger area that pasture would be. So that key area represents what we hope is average grazing in that pasture. So we, have, so we do a fair assessment. So from that key area, then we take 200 of those transects. You saw that little, and it'll come up again, but that little square there. So within that square, we measure where a raindrop would hit if it falls down on the ground. Okay, why would we measure that? Any idea? Yeah, for erosion potential. So if it's hitting a rock, whether it's hitting bare ground, whether it's hitting vegetative litter, whether it's hitting a live plant, um, so we measure that ground cover. And so we actually take three measurements on each one of those transects. We measure and count the different number of species and record the different number of species within that frame. We also will assign what we call a dry weight rank. So what an, a typical deer or a cow or whatever grazing animal is, is in that little transect, what would they eat? Which ones, which, how do they rank? Which is the number one species as far as forage production, two and three. We also measure trees and shrubs, and, and we also take a photo point. So we take 200 of those, and that's why I said it was a really dumb, boring part of, <laughs> of doing that. But we take 200 of those at each of those transects. And so when we get done, we have an idea of what the ground cover is for erosion potential. We have an idea of what the diversity of species are in there. We have also have an idea of the relative production of each of those species. Okay, so that's really cool. So we do that, we just actually got done with that about uh, three weeks ago. So that's really cool. So that's a snapshot of 2018, what happened in 2018, which is good to know, but just like the book face and the Snapchat and all that, what all that other stuff, you know, it's good to have that snapshot, but you also kind of want to see what happens over time. So the real power in collecting these data is not only having it for 2018, but I actually have a record for the last, since um, 1978 on that ranch. So I have 40 years of, of data that now I can analyze and start to establish and look at what trends are. And so I can see as mesquite increasing. So am I getting great invasion of woody species? Am I losing some of my desired perennial plants? Am I getting more annual plants? What, what, what is actually happening? Um, and then I can adjust my management to try to try to address some of those problems. So that, from an environmental standpoint, that is one of the really, really key things that I do on, on my ranch to, to look at sustainability and how do, I, how do I manage that. The real answer is it's all tied to precipitation. Um, we had a, when I worked with the university, we set up a lot of these range monitoring programs for ranchers. And one of my favorite, favorite, he was kind of a crusty, stereotypical rancher. Um, we were going through all this data analysis and looking at, you know, layman love grass versus grandma grasses. And he looked at us and said, it's the rain, dummy. <laughs> and he was right. It's a precipitation. Of the, the, the ground responds, of the environment responds to precipitation. You have a good rain year, you're going to be a good range manager, a good livestock producer. If you're in drought, you're going to have to really take some measures, drastic measures to, to prevent being a bad range manager or bad livestock producer. So that's from an environmental standpoint. Um, Chuck spent a good amount of time talking about genomics and genetics, um, and that's, that's really tied to the economic part of it. Um, I'll just mention one thing that I think is really, really um, critical, I think, in our industry. So I'm not a, a cowboy or a cattle producer or, or livestock producer. I think right now, um, and I think the mindset that we as livestock producers have to have is, is that we're food producers. People want a connection to how that food is raised, where it comes from, and all those things that, that, that 
that happen. So I cannot be focused on just that little piece of that life cycle that sh showed um, in producing that animal that then goes off to, um, to grass and to, to the feedlot. I've got to think about what are the ramifications of that entire life cycle and what am I doing to impact that in a positive way. The second part of that, and, and again, Chuck, I appreciate your, your talk because you did such a nice job talking about what you do with the retaining ownership and looking at the genomics, is traditionally in all of agriculture, not just beef production, but we are what we call price takers. We take our products to a market and we take whatever price is being offered. So I market most of my calves at Wilcox Livestock Auction. And so depending on what the market is doing, that's the price that I'm going to get for my calves. So I, I consider us a price taker. You know, whatever cotton's doing, whatever milk's doing, whatever those other commodities are doing, you're taking that price. And so the shift that I've had to make and that I've tried to make is to go from more of a price taker to a price maker. And so doing those things that add value to the livestock that I raise. And so some of those things are the livestock or the beef quality assurance. So making sure that my animals have a good health background, that they have a good vaccination background, making sure that they're raised in a low stress environment so that when they go somewhere, they're not gonna just flip out because that's the first time they've ever seen somebody on a horse or somebody on foot or somebody on an ATV. Um, trying to make sure that those cattle have the best genetics possible to be as efficient and through those next phases. And so that that next person hopefully can be profitable with them and, and so forth. And so doing those things to enhance the value to become more of a price maker than a price taker are some of the, some of the things. The third and final thing that I want to talk about is kind of kind of hits a societal um, part or the societal circle of that of that three legged stool that I that I mentioned is the cattle handling part. And I've been very, very fortunate that I've been working with National Cattlemen's Beef Association. They have a stockmanship and stewardship program. And so part of that effort is to demonstrate low stress handling practices that actually work um, on operations. And Chuck's been doing it for a long time. A lot of your ranchers have been doing it for a long, long time. But we actually put on demonstrations throughout the country and um, talk with producers using a lot of those things that in the livestock industry are common sense, but we don't think about that make handling cattle low stress. So like um, taking into account their flight zone, understanding that we're predators and their prey and doing different, different methods of interacting with them to where we don't um, increase their stress. And so use, you know, you've, you've probably heard of Dr. Temple Grandin. She was really revolutionary in a lot of her facilities design. So we take some of that. We take a lot of, um, there's um, some different really well-known cattle handlers that did a lot of stuff with wildlife and different um, grazing animals and so forth and taking those practices and putting on demonstrations of, of how we can actually do this in a low stress manner and make sure that um, we're doing our responsible job there. Because at the end of the day, I need to make sure that I'm producing a safe, wholesome product that goes on and is successful in the next stage of their life, all at the same time taking care of the resource that, that I'm responsible for. So. I think I'll, I'll conclude there just so that we have some time for questions, Lauren. everyone see see them okay all right well I think it's clear why we chose um, Sarah Dean and Chuck as innovators in their field not to use an old soil science joke but they are outstanding in their fields um, and from varying aspects of their locations in the state and so question to the three of you we as a beef community strive to continuously improve where do you see um, in each of your three passions and, and knowledge areas of expertise, where do you see the future of innovation for raising beef? I'll go first so Chuck doesn't steal my answer, but <laughs> I, th I think that, um, uh, and he mentioned it, but we're talking about, we, no, we, I didn't go into it very much, but genomics. Um, 
we've mapped the bovine genome. We know that there are, in addition to the genes responsible for things like feed efficiency and carcass quality, um, we know that there's, there are genes responsible for longevity. We know that there are genes responsible for all types of different characteristics. So by being able to dial in on those specific um, genetic um, capabilities and potentials of livestock, we can get livestock that are more closely suited to the environment and the production systems that we need. So I think that that innovation in genomics as it continues to develop is really, really going to be critical for those that choose to pay attention to it. The people that choose not to pay attention to it, um, they're going to get left behind. They're not going to be profitable. Um, so I think genetics is the is a huge piece of innovation in the future. So I didn't quite mention that in my presentation, but essentially over the last 30, 40 years, uh, we produce the same amount of beef with a third fewer cattle in the United States, which is a dramatic change. And all that has really taken place. Most of it has, has taken place because of genetic selection for uh, those traits of improved efficiency. And that's without all this added information that we have today. So I think that is something that we're essentially going to be pulling in information from a behavior standpoint, feeding standpoint, um, and better making those selection decisions as we go forward. So from, from my standpoint, really what we're interested in is making sure that we you know, set these benchmarks about every 10 years and actually say, where, where are we at? Are we getting better? What's, what are some of the things that we're not perhaps considering? Well, I guess I probably answered that. Um, in that the feed conversion efficiency, that part of thing, uh, is going to be the, the future of the industry. Um, and understanding the genetics of that, it's easier to predict what the weight of a calf is going to be when it's born, just like people. If you were a small baby, you're probably going to throw small babies or have small babies. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, but but the understanding of the feed conversion efficiency, it's all involved in the genetics. And once we understand that, then we can drive the whole industry in that direction. We just say, hey, use this semen and you're going to make more money. That's an easy sell. So uh, we have to understand it more. And we're getting there very very slowly. But the other thing is and maybe part of the polarization that we find ourselves in in the U.S. politically, but we've been that way for a long time between I always thought that I was an environmentalist and I belonged to environmental groups and hiking groups and all those things before I became a, ran became a rancher. And then all of a sudden I discovered I was the enemy. And it's the same thing. It's uh, taking care of the land. And there's various ways to take care of the land. And so uh, we, we've got to talk to each other and, and reduce some of these barriers. So that's a social kind of problem. But you have to under, understand the technology and the mechanics to say, well, if we would feed the cows this way, we could be a lot more friendly to the environment and so forth. So it's a learning process, but it's also a tolerance process. So encourage all of us, where we we're coming from, to try to understand the other one's point of view and help them. Thank you. I'd like to, yes. Yeah, so I think uh, that statistic I just told you of essentially what's happened in the United States is our cattle herd has gone down, but beef production has actually remained relatively the same or actually slightly increased, right? 
Um, and that's fairly consistent across most developed countries in the world, right? So um, from a standpoint of total methane emissions, not just methane per unit of beef, but total methane, our emissions have gone down in the United States um, and have in other places like Australia, right? So I think it's getting a lot of the stuff that these two gentlemen talked about, right, the actual practical day-to-day -day management things are what scales up to that difference globally. Um, so we can do things from a standpoint of changing what cattle eat. There are companies out there that are interested in different feed additives that can reduce methane emissions per animal. There are feed efficiency benefits of that. I didn't mention it, but methane is essentially a loss of the energy value of feed. So we've been interested in trying to reduce methane emissions for a long time in animal science to figure out how we can make animals more feed efficient, essentially. Um, but it is those little day-to-day -day things that actually scale up. So reproductive efficiency uh, is a huge driver from a standpoint of methane emissions, which seems kind of weird, right? How does that connect? But getting cows actually pregnant, getting them bred back so they're having a calf every year and they're not what we call open cows that are not pregnant on the landscape, eating feed, generating methane, but not producing a human usable product, not producing food. Um, all those little things actually do add up. So it's it's a, it's a challenge. We do have to think about these things globally, but it's kind of like the saying, right? Think globally, act locally. I mean, it's, it's on the ground where those changes actually take place. Um, and so from a standpoint of, you know, what are we going to do in the world? Some of it is translation of some of the technology or the methods, the principles that we have in the United States. And then obviously some, some places in the world, we can't just plop a an Angus cow in sub-Saharan Africa and expect her to do well, right? So there has to be that adaptation to the local environment as well um, in this whole process. Yes. I just want to stay um, on the methane part. Um, I think uh, research is done around uh, mixing a little bit of biochar into feed feedstock and that reduces methane emissions from cattle Yeah, so there is some research on, uh, so if you didn't hear the question, on biochar, so essentially charcoal, right, in terms of um, animals consuming that. So the, most of that research, I believe, has been done in, in what we call in vitro, so taking some of that rumen contents and essentially on a lab bench uh, looking at how it affects the methane production from that standpoint. Um, and that's one of the challenges is always, you know, how much do you have to feed the animals? Is it cost effective for the ranchers, right? Is it just an added cost that they're not getting anything back from it? Um, or does it have any other health effects um, and, and the, the, t the timing of it? Because that rumen ecosystem, it is an ecosystem. And some, some of these feed additives we, we may feed, the, the animals can adapt to it essentially and then go back to revert to the mean, if that makes sense. Um, so there is some work on that. There's, there's some work at UC Davis on seaweed that you may have heard about, right, because that got a lot of media press um, feeding essentially a very fine, fine amount of seaweed to the animals um, and reducing methane. So it will never be zero, but there are a few different avenues that are in that 20 to 30 percent range of reduction that, again, if it's cost effective, it can scale in terms of the production of it. Um, it may be a promising avenue going forward. I'll address rainwater harvesting. We use that extensively in, in, in our part of the world in southern Arizona. Um, and basically just above ground, um, you know, catching runoff and, and storing that. And so we line those tanks, we call them dirt tanks or, or ponds, we line those with bentonite clay to, to prevent that going back in there. Um, and we use that for both wildlife and livestock water. So not necessarily pumping out of there, but, but providing um, better distribution of our livestock by the placement of that water. So cattle go where water is. Um, and so by strategically having water in different areas of these larger pastures, we can more efficiently distribute those cattle and have less of an impact. But yes, we do use water harvesting extensively, but mostly by damming it up and using it in ponds. I, I might mention... Uh we think springs are 
wonderful things, and certainly we cattlemen do. And in the superstitions, besides the well at the house, all the water comes from springs in this dry, desert, rocky country. And so the preservation of a spring becomes very important. And so we've uh, done water development where you maybe clean out a spring box and, and rather than have it seep out on the ground and evaporate, which most springs do, you, uh, and <laughs> we did a water development of, of uh, taking storage tanks, water lines, and drinkers, which meant they had to go in by helicopter in my country. But they, we put them in there and then distributed them. So all of the springs uh, have boxes that contain the water and then they go out, uh, some by solar and some not, just by gravity feed, into storage tanks, which have floats that keep them only full and no, no water's wasted, onto drinkers, and we have several miles of pipe to spread the water from that localized source to various other places for management of cattle, because cattle go if there's feed and if there's water. So if you distribute the water around, then the cows will cover the country and not uh, ruin certain areas. But uh, just the saving of spring water is a, a major, from our point of view, because we're so dependent on it. But so to manage the water collection and then storage and maintaining rather than just have it evaporate away. So that's a type of thing that people don't necessarily think of. And, and we're restricted, most of us uh, in Arizona, and as, as you know, very small part of the state is private, and mostly around Tucson, Phoenix. So most of us are rangeland managers of state or federal properties or Indian properties. And so we just manage those, and so we don't have control, like I have proposed to the Department of Water Resources, collection basin, there's a lot of rock in the superstitions and a lot of natural channeling uh, that you could collect a large surface of water. And um, I was told, well, that's Department of Water Resources. If it hits the ground, it, it's ours. So if I'd cover all that land with plastic, I could collect it. But if it hits a natural environment, it's their water, and I can't use it. So there are s more things we could do, but of all things, we're re restricted by government regulations, if you will. Of, of it's hard to be innovative if it's unusual treatment of any kind. Interesting. Other questions? Yes. So <coughs> the, this program is to talk to you and me, and you've got some really innovative, I like all the data collection. Uh, do you think you can scale this up to I, th I think in my in my part of the world, I think the ones that are serious about being in business are are taking the majority, if not all, of those practices that I talked about. Um, and so I, I think it's 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 being adopted by again people that are serious about staying in this business. The part that I think I, is a challenge in in Arizona um, are the farms or ranches that. That if you if you forgive me if that are inherited that don't have necessarily a need to be profitable or sustainable that there's whatever they make on it is what they make on it and so I think Chuck has done a really really good job with the Arizona Cattle Industry Research Foundation to develop programs to educate people um, our our universities have done a good job as far as trying to develop programs our our commodity groups. Um, Farm Bureau, the Arizona Cattle Growers have all, also done outreach to try to um, encourage people to adopt these practices. But the bottom line is, is it's going to be market driven. Um, that's that's what it is. I mean, <laughs> when you get down to it, if it's profitable, it'll be adopted, and if it increases profitability, it'll be adopted. I will think to your point as 
um, one point, it is likely that the correlation between um, record keeping and data <clears throat> that goes with that record keeping and oversight increases with the herd size and the, the operation of the ranches um, number of animals. So it's likely, likelier that the larger the ranch in terms of animals, um, they are um, utilizing the genetic uh, tools available and the record keeping and the animal identification, especially when we talk about dairies and feed yards um, that get even larger and I think they are the probably the earliest adapters of those technologies as well. I think we have one more um, time for one more question if we'd like. Yes. Uh, let's just wrap up with the sustainability now. Um, how can the beef industry take the idea of sustainability to the masses, to the large public, knowing that sustainably produced goods, either beef or other food products, are seen as a product for the narrow sector of society who has the means and the purchasing power to afford it. So how can we make this sort of a larger reality so that the sustainably produced beef can also be accessible? And uh, that's still crucial. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I'll just tell you, within the industry, how we view sustainability is it's pre-competitive. Right? It's not a differentiating factor of this beef is sustainable, this is not. Um, obviously, market, market forces will drive a lot of this, but in terms of that underlying, you know, those principles of the, the, the three-pillared stool, right, a three-legged stool, um, that is something that the whole industry recognizes. It's like food safety, right? You're not going to go to the store and be like, well, this beef has E. coli on it and this one doesn't. Which, which choice am I going to make, right? The idea is that whatever you're going to, go and choose is going to be sustainably raised. Um, obviously, there will, be <laughs> there will be changes in terms of market forces, who is an early adopter, who is not. Um, I think what, what's also going to help that process is obviously all the technology that we have in terms of tracking and, and in increasing the amount of traceability that's within the beef industry will put data behind that assertion that whatever you buy is going to be sustainably produced. But we had to recognize that there are choices out there as well, right? That um, it can't all be at a premium price. And sometimes those products that are a premium price, if we look at the actual outcome measures, uh, you may be better off buying a commodity product anyways from a sustainability standpoint, if that makes sense. I, th I think just to address that really quickly, I think you address that from, from both ends of the equation as well. I think, number one, we have to continue to make sure that we develop new technologies and we, with that we encourage people to uh, accept and adopt these where they're appropriate, because not all of them are appropriate in all operations. But so from that side, but the other side of it too is, is that we as beef producers in the beef industry, we have to give people permission to feel good about eating beef, to know that it is raised responsibly. Um, so if we raise it responsibly, responsibly and then giving people permission to, to feel good about making that choice um, because beef is still a protein of choice that people want to have at the center of their plate, but they need to feel good about doing that and feel good that it's being raised responsibly. Well, thank you to all of you for having us today, and thank you to you three for sharing your expertise. Um, thank you very much.